All right, so this is the answer key for the unit one practice test on measurement, units, conversions, and moles. So we're going to start with some measurement. And in each case, I'm going to show you the answer and explain uh, how you come about finding the answers, especially when we get later on in the calculations. I'll go step by step. This first one is uh, just this box here, and it asks you to find the proper recording of the measurement, including uncertainty. Now, uncertainty has to do with basically how far off could your estimate be given the measurements that you're using with your ruler in this case, or your graduated cylinder, which we'll get to in a minute. So this is related to sig figs. So what you want to do, first of all, to record the measurement, we can see that the box is measured or has ends right about there. So this is measured. It doesn't give us units, but uh, the units are down here. So this is in centimeters. So we have one centimeter and 1.5 centimeter marked, and which means that the small markings are tenths. So this is 1.1, uh, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. So the box, the end of the box, falls between the 1.3 and the 1.4. So I'm going to write this as 1.3, and then you always have to estimate in between the two marks that you have on the ruler. So it's between 1.3 and 1.4. To me, it looks like it's a little more than halfway, so I'm going to write that down as 1.36. Okay, you might say 1.37, you might say 1.35, but the key is you have to have two decimal places because the markings on the ruler are the first decimal, and then you always have to estimate one decimal place beyond your measurement device. The uncertainty comes in. The way you write the uncertainty is you take your look again at what is the smallest marking. The smallest marking is at the tenths. So your uncertainty is plus or minus half of that marking. So in this case, half of a tenth is 0.05. So this is saying that I'm estimating 1.36. I may be off. It could be closer to 1.4, or it could be closer to 1.3. And again, the, if you add 0.5, that would actually get you over 1.4. But the way you write the uncertainty is take the smallest measurement, divide it in half, and write that down, plus or minus 0.05. I recorded the measurement as 1.36 because I'm estimating the hundredths. And my ruler has tenths, so I can go to the hundredths and estimate. All right, let's take a look at the next one. This one came out a little bit blurry when I, when I blew it up, but um, you can see here we have, again, centimeters. We have the 9 and the 10, and then we have the markings in between. So this would be, for example, 9.5. So each marking, again, is one-tenth. So it looks like it's got a little dotted line here showing that it looks like it's just between somewhere in between the 0.4 and the 0.5. So I'm going to mark it as 9.4. This one looks like it's probably a little bit less than half, so I would say maybe 9.43. Again, that last digit is an estimate. So everyone in, you know, in the world who's reading this and understands how the measurements work should write 9.4. And then the last digit might vary slightly from person to person. You might say 9.42 or 9.44. Um, but everyone should have 9.4 the same, the last digit might change. And again here, since the markings are at the 0.1, my uncertainty is half that, which is 0.05. So 9.43 plus or minus 0.05 centimeters. Basically, it's the, that last digit that you write. You want to put a five in that place. So we, we estimated the hundredths, so it could be off by up to five hundredths. Okay, this is another measurement question. This one's a graduated cylinder. Remember, for graduated cylinders, a couple things to keep in mind. You always want to measure the lowest point, not the highest point. So find the lowest point. It looks like it's just here, a little bit below that line. So what is that line? Well, here's 40 and 50 which means that each line here is one milliliter. So this doesn't go to the tenths. It only goes to the, the, the ones place. So this would be 44. This line would be 45. 
So the, the low point of the water, which that, that little dip there is called a meniscus. The low point of the meniscus, which is where you want to measure, is just below the 45, but clearly above the 44. So I'm going to record this as 44, say, 0.8. Okay, and again, everyone should write 44. There should be no argument that it's between 44 and 45 because the markings show that. The difference, the variation is in that last digit, which is an estimate. Again, 44.9, 44.7 would both be valid. Uh, and then the uncertainty here, a little different from the other ones because the markings are at ones. So half of a one would be 0.5. Again, what I did is I looked at the, the estimated digit and I wrote my uncertainty plus or minus five in that place. So plus or minus five tenths because my estimate was in the tenths. Okay, so that's how we do measurement and uncertainty. Now we're gonna get more into counting and calculating with significant figures. And the significant figures is related to the measurement, right? We call these significant figures. Always the significant figures include every single marking on your ruler or graduated cylinder or beaker plus one estimated place. So the markings here are the ones. So I estimate the tenths. This would be three significant digits. It's indicating how I measured that value. So in this case, all, we're, all you're asked to do is determine the number of significant figures. So you have to remember the rules for significant figures. The rules say that anything that is not a zero is a significant digit, always. That's the easiest part. So when do zeros count and when don't they count? Well, zeros do not count, or sorry, zeros do count if they're in between two other numbers or they're at the end of a number with a decimal point. So what does that mean? If we look at this number, there's one, two, three digits that aren't zero. So I know I've got three significant figures. Then I have a zero and I have to determine is that zero significant or not? Well, two criteria for a zero that counts. It's either in between two other digits. This is not, there's no digit on the, the end of this number. So the zero is the last digit. So when a zero is at the end, it only counts as significant if that number has a decimal point that's written. Right? There's, there's a decimal point here that's implied, but it's not shown. So that doesn't affect whether or not that zero is significant. So this is at the end of a number without a decimal point. So it's not between two other numbers and there's no decimal point. Therefore, that is not a significant figure. There are three significant figures in that number. Number two, five, three, and six. So those are not zero. So that's three for sure. And now I've got a zero again. Do I have four or do I have three significant figures? Well, here's a zero that's between the three and the six. So if a zero is between two other digits, it is significant. So that means this actually has four significant figures because that zero in the middle is significant. The third one, and the easy part is, well, I've got two digits that aren't zero. So now I've got at least two significant figures. And then I've got several zeros. Do any of those zeros count as significant? Well, we say that it's if it's in between two other numbers, are any of these zeros between two other numbers that aren't zero? Right, because a couple of these zeros are in between zeros, but that doesn't matter. No, these zeros are not between digits. This zero at the end is not between digits. So that rule does not apply. So the second part is zeros at the end of a number with a decimal point are significant. So both things have to be true. The zero has to be at the end, which means to the right. This zero is to the right. It's at the end of the number. It's called a trailing zero. It trails the other digits. So it's at the end and there's a decimal point in the number. doesn't matter where the decimal point is. There's a decimal point. So a zero at the end of a number that has a decimal point is significant. So now I'm up to three significant figures because I've, I've determined that that's significant. What about the other zeros? Those zeros are not between other numbers and they are not trailing the significant figures. They're not at the end, right? They're at the beginning. So one thing that confuses people is they say, well, these zeros are after the decimal point. That doesn't matter. 
Okay, the fact that the zeros are after the decimal point isn't what matters, is are they after the other digits? Okay, so these zeros come before the three and the two. So they're not trailing the significant figures, they're leading. So those are leading zeros, not trailing zeros. Leading zeros never, ever, ever count as significant figures. I can say that with 100% confidence. If you start on the left-hand side and the first thing you come to is a zero, it doesn't count. In fact, no zeros would count ever. If you start with a zero, don't count any numbers until you get to something that's not a zero. That's sort of the quickest way I can explain it. If you start with a zero, skip every zero you find until you come to something that's not a zero. So skip it, skip it, skip it, skip it. Those aren't significant. Now, I'm not changing the number. I'm just showing you that those are not significant. So the only things that are left are the three, two, and the zero at the end. So that has three significant figures. Okay, so non-zero digits always count. Zeros between other numbers always count, even if there's more than one. Zeros at the end of a number count if there's a decimal point. Okay, but zeros at the beginning never count, and zeros at the end don't count if there's no decimal point. All right, calculations. So we have different rules for different types of calculations. So when you're adding and subtracting, well, let's just do the calculation first. If I add these numbers together, I get 8.86. There's no unit on this because we're just focusing on the calculation. So that's the, that's the answer when you put that in the calculator. The rule for significant figures and rounding says when you're adding or subtracting, your answer cannot be more precise than the numbers you started with. What does that mean, really? It means find the number that has the least number of decimal places even if there's no decimal places. In this case, this number has two, uh, sorry, this number has one. The second number has two de decimal places. So this number is what determines my rounding. It has one decimal place, which means my answer can only have one decimal place. So I round here, and since the next digit is a six, my final answer is 8.9, okay? I can't have more than one decimal place because I started with a number that only has one decimal place. And it's not about, the fact that that number came first, it's look at all the numbers in the, in the process, find the one with the fewest decimal places and round your answer to that number of decimal places. Even if it's the third number in a three number addition problem, whichever one has the least decimal places. Uh, so the next one is multiplication. The rule for multiplication is a little bit different. So let's take a look at what we get when we multiply these two numbers together, we get 0 0.01716. Okay, that's what the calculator says. The rule for multiplying and dividing says that your answer cannot have more significant digits than any of the numbers you started with. So find the number with the fewest digits. This has two significant figures. Those zeros in front, leading zeros, not significant. So that number has two significant digits, which means my answer can only have two significant digits. So again, if I start here, that's not significant, that's not significant. Here's the first significant digit, here's the second significant digit, so I round it there. My final answer would be 0 0.017, because the next digit was a one, so I don't have to round up. All right, and again, it's a coincidence here that both of these numbers were the first number in line. That is not always the case. It's just about how many digits there are, either before the decimal or total, depending on, uh, sorry, either after the decimal or total. Now the last one's a little trickier because it's a mixed operation. We have addition in parentheses and then we have a multiplication. So how do you handle that? Well, the way to do it is you add the numbers in parentheses because that's the order of operation. You gotta do the parentheses first. So I would round, I would add that and get 4.23, uh, sorry, 4.26. Rule for rounding says that my answer when I add can't have more decimal places than the numbers I started with. This only has one decimal place. Here's an example where it's not the first number that determines the rounding, it's the number with the fewest decimal places. Which means that the answer to this part of the, the operation is rounded to 4.3. Okay, so I do that rounding here. Now I'm going to multiply by 6.55 and I get 29.6715. Okay, 
Okay, so my answer can't have more than two digits, okay, because this has two digits according to the rounding from the addition. So therefore, my answer can only have two digits, which means I'm actually going to round this to 30. Um, so depending on where you rounded in this equation, um, you may have rounded this down or you know rounded it off to 29. If this wasn't a 6, maybe you didn't do this rounding first because this is a slightly smaller number. Um, this would be a case where you really got to show your work. Okay, because if you round that to 29, because of the way you rounded the first step, I need to see that so that I can, you know, mark your, your grade accordingly. Because maybe you did the rounding right based on something you did in the first step. So I want to be able to see that and give you credit for that. All right. Conversions, dimensional analysis, which is just a fancy way of saying conversions. So the first thing you need to know is... The volume of a water bottle is 1.4 liters. What would that be in ml, milliliters? So here are the things you need to know. You need to know the metric prefixes, kilo, centi, and milli. A kilo something, kilogram, kilometer, kiloliter, means 1,000 units. Okay, so a kilometer is a thousand meters. A kilogram is a thousand grams. Grams or meters, right? So grams or meters are what's called the base unit. That's one unit. Um, centi means one hundredth of a base unit. There are one hundred centimeters in a meter, or a meter is equal to a hundred centimeters, depending on how you want to look at it. And milli is a thousandth. Okay, so you need to know those three prefixes. I'm not going to give those to you. I'll give you other um, conversions if they're not part of this metric unit here. Uh, but those three prefixes, I'm going to expect you to know. So now we have 1.4 liters. So with the, since there's no uh, little letter there, that means that's a base unit. Basically, if the abbreviation is only one letter, it's a base unit. So 1.4 liters, I want to convert that to milliliters. Well, we said that milliliters is a thousandth, right? Or the, so you could either put this as one milliliter is one thousandth of a liter, right? That's what we said. Or you could reverse that and say 1,000 milliliters equals one liter, whichever one you want to do. You'll get the same answer either way. So I'm writing this here this way is another way of writing that. It's the same relationship. It's 1,000. It's 1,000 milliliters for every liter. So now I can cancel out the liters, multiply 1.4 times 1,000, and I get 1,400 milliliters. If your desk is 0.65 meters wide, how wide is it in inches? And I apologize. There's actually a typo here. These are reversed. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters. So, yeah, I'll make sure that's correct on the test. And if you carried out the operation using the, the incorrect conversion, because that's the way it's written, I mean, I gave it to you that way. Again, show your work so I know where the error came from. In this case, it came from a typo that I didn't catch. So we need to convert meters to inches. Well, I don't have a conversion between meters and inches. What I have is a converted conversion between inches and centimeters. So first, I'm going to have to convert the meters to centimeters. A meter is a hundred centimeter, or a, a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter. Same thing. Right? Over here, you need to know that. So that converts the meters to centimeters, and then I use the conversion factor of 2.54 centimeters equals one inch. Again, if you reverse that, because of the typo, your answer is going to look slightly different, but the setup I'm going to show you here. Okay, so I multiply that out, and I get, so I multiply that out, and I get 25.5 
9 inches. Now, <clears throat> the rule for rounding, so this is all multiplication and division. So the rule for rounding and multiplication and division says my answer can't have more digits than the numbers I started with. The number I started with here has two significant digits. So my answer has to be rounded to two digits, which in this case would be 26 inches. One quick important note on this, a conversion factor like this, because you might say, well, whoa, 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 that only has one significant figure. You're right. Um, and that's a good catch. But conversion factors are not considered when you're doing rounding because this is considered to be an exact measurement. It's like a count. Like if I say there are 20 students in the room because I counted them, that's not an estimate. There's no significant figures involved. There are exactly 20 students in the room. So therefore, you don't, you don't consider that when you're rounding. The same is for con conversion factors. Because of the accepted value here, we say that one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. There's no estimation there. So this part of it doesn't factor into the, the rounding at the end. Only the measured value that they gave you at the beginning is what you need to use. All right, so here is a conversion problem. It's got a couple parts to it, a um, couple of conversions, and uh, two different things that you have to convert. So we're going to tackle these one at a time, and then we'll add them together, which is the, the, the question at the end is how much will everything cost all together? So at the end, we're going to combine the answers that we start with sorry, the answers that we find along the way. All right, so we have, first of all, 15 pounds of propane that costs $2.03 per kilogram. Okay, so we've got the measurement originally in pounds, but the price is based on kilograms, so we're going to have to fix that. And we're given a conversion for pounds, but the conversion is to grams. So we're going to have to do a little bit of work there because we need to get from grams to kilograms so that we can calculate the cost. All right, let's work through this. And then we'll have to do the same thing for the, the uh, liquid nitrogen, but the process is going to be roughly the same. All right, so I'm going to start with the 15 pounds. I need to convert that 15 pounds into kilograms but I can't do it directly because I'm not given the conversion between pounds and kilograms, I'm given pounds and grams. So one pound, because I want pounds on the bottom so it cancels out, is 454 grams, okay? That converts pounds to grams. Now I have to convert grams into kilograms Right? And one kilogram, remember you need to know kilo means a thousand units. So one kilogram is 1,000 grams. So now I've converted pounds to grams and then converted that into kilograms. So now I have kilograms and I know my price per kilogram. So one kilogram costs two dollars and three cents. So here's how the units cancel through. I've got pounds and pounds that cancel. I've got grams and grams that cancel. So that's the process converted grams, sorry, pounds to grams, grams to kilograms. The kilograms here cancel each other out. So what I'm left with at the end is the unit dollars. How much money? So I want my answer to be in money, in units of money, which is dollars. So there you go. That tells me I set up all the conversions correctly. So when I do that, I find that it's 13.8243. And hopefully right away you say, well, that is way too many digits, way too many decimal places for sure, and way too many digits. Go back to your original amount. It was two digits, no decimal places. Uh, but this is multiplication and division, so we're really looking at the digits. Two digits means my answer must be only two digits, so I round it to 14. Okay, 13.8 rounds to 14. So that is the final answer for the cost of propane.
uh, given that I need 15 pounds in the price per kilogram. Okay, so then part two is converting the liquid nitrogen. So we have seven and a half pounds of liquid nitrogen. We're going to follow the same steps. Need to convert pounds to grams. Okay, 454 grams per pound is times one kilogram is a thousand grams times the price, which for the liquid nitrogen we said was 62 cents per kilogram. So the way I like to do these, by the way, I kind of just gave the answer at the end of the calculations on the first row. Uh, I like to multiply all the numbers across the top and then multiply all the numbers across the bottom and then divide. So when you do this out, what you would get is um, you'd get 2,100 over 1,000, which is $2.1. Okay, again, my answer can only have two digits because I started with a number that only had two digits and this is multiplying and dividing. All right, finally, the final question is how much will it all cost together? Well, I've got 14, I've got 2.1, that's $16.1. Rounding rules though say I can't have more decimal places when I'm adding and subtracting uh, than the smallest number of decimal places, which was this one, which has no decimal places. So the final answer with the correct number of significant figures here would be $16 even, okay? Because there's no decimal places allowed by rules of rounding. All righty, molar mass, okay? To find the molar mass, we're going to need the periodic table. But the way you calculate molar mass is you look at each element. So we've got magnesium, oxygen, and hydrogen. So let's get those molar masses first. Magnesium. Molar mass is 24.31. Uh, hydrogen is 1.1. Oxygen is 16. Okay, so go back. We've got 23.41 plus oxygen is 16 plus hydrogen is 1.01. That group is in parentheses times two. That's what the little two, it's called a subscript, outside the parentheses means. It means we double everything inside the parentheses. So that gives us 23.41 plus 16 plus 1.01 .01 twice, which is 34.02 which means that our final answer is 58.33, right? And if you, uh, actually I should say this is 16.00, so I don't want to throw off the, the decimal places there, so that was my fault for leaving off those decimal places. So we're adding and we're multiplying, um, so really, our answer should have three digits, so we'd round that to 58.3 grams. All right, next one, nitrogen, hydrogen, chlorine. We've already talked about um, oxygen. Sorry, we've already talked about hydrogen. Nitrogen is here, that's 14.1. And chlorine, it's hidden under there, but here it is, it's 35, oops, 35.45. Okay, so we're going to add the nitrogen, the chlorine, and the hydrogen. Going back, so we have nitrogen, which is 14.01 plus hydrogen four times, so 1.01 .01 times four plus, plus um, chlorine, which was 35.45. Okay, so we multiply, we end up with 14.01 uh, plus 
4.04 plus 35.45. Okay. Um, now we're adding, and we end up with 53.5 grams. Okay, and I didn't round that. That's actually what it comes out to. And when we add these three numbers together, we get 53.5. So there wasn't any rounding that took place there. If I had to round, all of these numbers have two decimal places. So I could have had two decimal places, because, but it comes out exactly to 53.5. So I didn't round it. Uh, I just left it as the exact number. Okay, next conversions. 51.8 grams of H2O is how many moles? Okay, so we're going from grams to moles. In order to get from grams to moles, you divide the grams that you're given, uh, eight grams, by the molar mass of the compound. So we have to find the molar mass of the compound. Hydrogen is 1.01, .01, oxygen is 16.00. So 1.01 .01 times 2 plus 16.00. So that's 2.02 .02 plus 16.0. So that would be 18.02. Uh, .02. So we divide this by 18.02 .02. grams per mole is that unit. And I end up with 2.88 moles. Okay, my answer has three digits because my starting number had three digits. So divide the grams that you're given, the amount that you're given, by the molar mass of the compound, which we had to find first. Uh, and that's how you convert from grams to moles. Next question, it has this many formula units. Formula units is another... Um, it's not exactly the same as a molecule, but you can kind of think of it in your head as molecule. Uh, it's just we use the term formula units for something that's uh, actually this should say molecules, but never mind. Formula units, molecules essentially mean the same thing. There's a, there's a difference that we'll talk about later, but you don't need to worry about it. Just how many things are there? Well, we want to convert things to moles, the number of things to moles. Well, to do that. We divide the number of things that we have. Um, I'm just going to put units to keep it shorter. By the number of units in a mole. And at a mole of anything is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd units per mole. So I divide 4.53 times 10 to the 24th units by how many units there are in a mole. And actually, I'm going to adjust this to make the, the calculation a little bit easier. You don't have to do this, especially if you're using a calculator. But just to show you how this actually works, 4.53 times 10 to the 24th is the same number as 45.3 times 10 to the 23rd. They're the same number. I just moved the decimal point and adjusted the... Uh, exponent, and I did that so that I have the same exponent on the top and the bottom. I don't have to do that. The calculator can can address that for me. But what I wanted to show you is that because I did that, this actually all cancels out. So I'm left with 45.3 divided by 6.02, which comes out to 7.52 moles. Okay, rounded to three digits because my starting number had three significant figures. Okay, last uh, conversion problem. This one is asking me to go from grams of methane to molecules. I can't go from grams to molecules directly, but I can go from grams to moles. We've already seen that. And I can go from moles to units or molecules. So it's kind of a combination of those first two problems in terms of how we're going to tackle this calculation. I have to convert to times. I have to convert grams to moles and then convert the moles to molecules. 
Um, so I'm going to show you how I'm going to show you both steps individually. You could actually set this up as one uh, dimensional analysis problem. So 72.5 grams convert to moles. How do we do that? Take the amount of grams you're given, divide it by the molar mass, which in this case would be 12.01 plus 1.014 times, which equals 16.05 grams per mole. Put that down here. So 72.5 grams divided by 16.5 uh, is 4.52 moles, right? So I've got four and a half times the amount it would take to make one mole. So four and a half moles. Now I can convert moles into units by multiplying by the number of things in each unit, uh, sorry, in each mole. So four and a half times... Um, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd is 27.21 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Uh, and hopefully in the time it took me to write molecules, you were saying, wait, but that's not scientific notation. I hope you were saying that. Uh, you're right, because this is two digits to the left of the decimal point, and that is not allowed in scientific notation. So I have to move that over one and make it 2.7121 times 10 to the 24th, okay? I move the decimal point one place to the left, I add one to the exponent, uh, and so one more time you might hopefully be saying, whoa, you didn't round that right. True. So the final answer is 2.72 uh, 2 times 10 to the 24th molecules. Okay, because I started with a number that had three digits, I had to round that answer down to three digits. Okay, so this one, especially when you've got multiple steps like this, so important that you show me your work, show me the setup. I know you are going to use the calculator to do the actual math, but if you did this through and you rounded somewhere along the way when you're doing calculations like this, that can make a huge difference by the time you get to the end. And I need to be able to see that the different answer you got at the end is because you rounded, you know, back in step one differently than I did. Or you rounded in step one when you didn't need to. Something like that. So here's the, the final answer. All right. So the first one is looking at some data. Uh, are these calculations accurate, precise, neither or both? The question got cut off there. But um, so if the actual accepted value, so the correct answer is 2.7. Are these answers accurate, precise, neither or both? Well, you could make an argument that this first measurement is fairly accurate. It's pretty close to the accepted value. So you, again, you could say, well, the first one's accurate, but the other two are not at all accurate. They're very far off from the accepted value. And then the fact that the three of these things are very different from each other means not precise. Okay, so there's no that this this set of data is not precise, and you know these two are also not accurate. Um, the first one's accurate, but since all three of them are different, it suggests to me, looking at it, that you kind of got lucky with that because you did it three times and you got different answers each time. So you were probably making some mistakes along the way, and it just happened that the mistakes you made on this one worked out so that you ended up close to the right answer. So that's not really the way you want to be. Um, you want to be close to the answer and get the same one every time. That tells me that you repeated the process um, successfully, and you did all the measurements and calculations correctly. All right, so if you just said not precise and not accurate, I would accept that, uh, but I do want to say, you know, this answer, that's accurate, but the fact that it's one among three that are wildly different means that it probably was just lucky. So uh, that's how I would answer that question. And then the last one, again, part of it's getting covered up here, but 
you, you have a, what is supposed to be a pure, not solver, you need to be a pure solver, um, pure silver coin, and you're being asked to pay a significant amount of, money, amount of money for it, how would you go about determining whether or not this is pure silver? And let's assume, since it's, you know, a, a coin dealer that you can't, like, melt it down and find its melting point or do any other sort of destructive kind of testing on it. Well, one way you would do that um, is to find its density. And if it's supposed to be pure silver, you can look up the density of pure silver. And if those two numbers do not match, then you can say for sure the coin is not pure silver because density is a property of silver that does not change. So what I really want to do is find the density of the coin. How you go about that? We, we did this uh, in the lab, but roughly, you know, you need to collect some data. First, you need to uh, determine the volume, right? Because density equals mass divided by volume. So determine, why don't we start with determine the mass. First step is to determine the mass of the coin. Determine the volume of the coin. Once you have the mass and the volume, you can calculate the density. Once you've calculated the density of the coin, you can look up the density of pure silver. That's a known value. And then you compare. Compare the density of the coin, which you've calculated, to the density of pure silver. If those two numbers are not the same, you can say with absolute certainty that the coin is not pure silver. Little trick, though. If you find that the density is the same, that doesn't 100% guarantee that the coin is pure silver. Because you could come up with a combination of other things that might have the same density as silver. So you can exclude it. Right? You can say if the numbers don't match, it's not pure silver. End of story. But the fact that it is the same density doesn't necessarily mean it's pure silver. It would be unlikely that you could find something that's not pure silver, that has the same density, but it's possible. So just throwing that out there. Data table. Um, just like what we did in the lab, you need the, uh, the mass of the coin. You need the volume. Uh, you, I would assume this is an irregular shape because it's an old coin. It might be worn down. It's got... Um, these Roman coins had, you know, images stamped on them and that sort of thing. So it's not something you can measure with a ruler. So we're going to use displacement. So you need to record the volume of water in a graduated cylinder. And then the volume of water plus the coin. And then to find the volume... Calculation-wise, you need to do volume equals, I'm going to say this is like number one and number two, just for the, the sake of illustration. Volume is one, uh, sorry, two minus one. So the final volume of the cylinder, when it has the coin in it, minus the starting volume of the cylinder, gives you the difference, which is the volume of the coin. You've got the mass. You can calculate the density. Okay, so something like that. Uh, would be totally acceptable um, for the answer to the question that's going to be similar to this, asking you to uh, outline a procedure, provide a data table. You don't need to fill it in. You don't need to make up data and make up the calculations. Just explain what steps would you go through, create a data table to gather the data, and then explain what calculations you would need to perform. You don't have to show me you know, fake numbers. That's okay. All right, so that is it. I'll give you a periodic table. Uh, I will give you conversions other than the ones I mentioned. Kilo, centi, milli, you need to know those. But if it's like inches to centimeters or pounds to kilograms or, sorry, pounds to grams or gallons to liters, things like that, I will give you. I'm not asking you to memorize every conversion possible. Just kilo, centi, milli, you need to know what those three are. All right, there's the answers.